right. <laughs> Mr. Mateo. All right, so uh, I'm Mateo. Would you rather we sit up first and like to stare at the sun? Uh, that'd be fantastic. Part of the class is largely going to be me nattering at you and asking questions and seeing how you guys feel about it and taking your sort of questions and seeing if I can help you answer them. The second part, I'm actually going to try to give you some... The second part, I'm going to try to give you guys some specific... Uh, a couple of different things that I've found helping me get past my plateaus when I've been fencing as I'm coming up. Um, they're just going to be very simple, kind of beautiful things, and stuff that I teach all the time, but I actually think that it's probably the, 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 the most useful tool to get past them. So that'll be the second half. The first half is just be nattering. The second half will actually probably hopefully get up on the feet if we have time. Uh, so, but I want to talk about um, pushing the envelope. So every fighter, I don't care how good they are or how long they've been fighting, uh, has a journey that, that looks like this. And then sometimes it does this, and then sometimes it goes back up. But it's, it's a lot, lots of hills and valleys and lots of plateaus. You see fighters talk about this all the time. I'm on a plateau, I've got a plateau, I can't get off this plateau, yada, 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 yada. What they're really talking about is they get to a point in their game where it is not improving and other people's games are improving. Okay? Everybody climbs these mountains and, and deals with these things at different rates. So sometimes it feels like you're standing still and everybody else is, is continuing to progress. Which is true. They're discovering things about themselves or about their game or about fencing in general that either you've already discovered or haven't yet learned about yourself or from them, etc., etc. And they're going to start climbing while you're standing there. It can be very, very frustrating. A lot of people uh, react to these moments in their fencing career uh, and say, well, this is as good as I'm ever going to be. This is my game. This is where I stop. And that is exactly the wrong reaction. So I'm hopefully going to talk about some ways that you can get past it. Right? But first, I also, but there's, there's another aspect of this, pushing the envelope, where I want to talk about how to beat somebody who you believe is better than you. Okay? You are in the first round of Queens and you draw crowd, you draw Corbin, you draw one of these cats that you know has won Queens before, you know they beat you all the time in practice, they're, you know that they're a better fencer than you. I want to talk about how to be a better player, how to push that envelope as well. So let's talk about that first because that's a shorter portion. Mentality and psychology when you're on the field is really important. And everything that happens from the moment your name is called to the moment you're saluting your dead opponent uh, is all important, including how you appear, how you carry yourself, and, and how you come on the guard, all of that. All right? That's part of the psychological game of fencing. All right? I have seen so many times, this is what I see. I see this in the first three rounds of, uh, first two or three rounds, and I'm borrowing somebody's sword, uh, of, uh, of the Rose Tournament Golf or every whoever I get called out against. This is what happens. Don Mateo and somebody, right? Almost inevitably somebody who's a cadet or a new fighter. That person goes, oh, that's the first thing, right? Okay, you've already lost. You've already lost. You've already looked at that. Instead of looking at it as an opportunity to have an exciting fight and to be David against Goliath or whatever you want to call me. I'm not just too great. Right? Um, you're, you've already missed the opportunity. You've already almost tossed it away to actually win that fight and come out at the end of that having a great fight. Okay. You've also probably sacrificed the ability to learn because you're concerned about losing, to learn from that. Even if you do get beat, if you go out there and give it your all, you're probably actually going to find something in that fight that's good for you. The next moment is inevitable. I come out, I give a nice salute to them, I give a nice salute to the crown, I give a salute to my lady, and I get this. Okay. I'm standing over here, and I, I just made several steps to salute to my opponent, just went, I am very frightened. <laughs> right? Okay. No matter how scared you are, the person you're fighting, lie to them. Lie to them. You need to be just as confident as they will. Alright? You need to not let them know that you're terrified of fighting this person. You shouldn't be. This will help you not be frightened of them. Okay? So when they give that sharp salute, you give a sharp salute. Bam. Alright? Make it pretty. Make it sharp. Don't make it stupid. You know, you don't need to do like a big twirl and a this and a that. But give a nice, sharp, strong salute and say, I'm here too. I got a sword, what do you got? Okay? That's the first step. And if you if you come out there and you are physically in that space where you are physically showing confidence and courage, you're gonna find that it actually starts to appear in your body. And it starts to appear in your mind. That that in trying to physically embody that emotion or that attitude will translate into your fight. Okay? The next step of that psychology is inevitably when they come on guard. I'm going to come on guard. I have a reason for my guard. I come on line. I take a guard that is strong and poised. Okay? Confident. All right? 
and I did this. Okay? One of these guards says I'm going to win, the other one says I'm going to lose. Okay? Don't be the person saying I'm going to lose with your guard. Don't let your body say that. Let your body say, I'm ready for it. What, what, what you got? Bring it. Bring it here. Let's see, let's see how this plays out. Okay? On the salute, this is this is advice I got from a friend of mine, uh, Don Michael St. Christian, a long time ago. He teaches a class on being better on it, um, focused entirely on that. And this is what he does when he comes up against somebody that he feels is better than him or is a threat to him. When he salutes, he closes his eyes and he says, I don't know how to lose. I don't know how to lose. None of us train to lose. None of us train in fencing to get beat, right? We all try to train to win. We all try to train to defeat the opponent, to stay alive, to defend ourselves. None of us know how to lose. We all know how to win. And if we go with what we know, we're a lot better off. And we're a lot more like that. So if you find yourself being frightened, if you find yourself losing that headspace, close your eyes. Don't finish your salute until you've said it to yourself and you believe it. You don't know how to lose. And then come on and you find yourself in a stronger place. Your fight's going to Yes. Oh. <laughs> yeah, sure. Yep. Awesome. Yeah, go ahead and shift yourselves and stay out of the sun. Yeah, don't, don't, don't worry about me. All right, so talk to the guard. Um, some people walk on the field and have like a very clear field presence. Like they walk on the field and everybody goes and looks at them. Um, that starts from within. It's going to sound a little bit. Uh, this is going to sound a little bit esoteric, but the people who have really good fight presence start with it with, with confidence in their ability. This is what I know. This is what I can do. I've been practicing all month. I've been practicing all week. I've been practicing for 15 years. This is my field. This is mine. Uh, Try to generate that confidence, and then if you want to have that strong field presence, if you want to be somebody who the people kind of look at when you walk out on the field, focus internally on pushing that field presence out. Okay? It's hard to do. It, 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 that, that's a kind of a vague instruction. But if you just sort of visualize that energy, that confidence in here, or sort of this light, you can push it out and just keep working on it as you walk out. Keep, keep working on it. Keep trying to do that. And you'll be, you'll be surprised. You'll walk out of the field if you start, if you're focusing on pushing that out from you, people start going, bam, and look at you. And your opponent, more importantly, will go, hmm, what's this guy got that this person didn't have? You know, last time I fought. What, 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 what did they learn? Uh oh. <laughs> what now? And look, now they're saluting very tightly. Oh, and now they're coming on guard like they know, like they know what they're doing. This is a whole new game for me. I gotta, I gotta be careful here. All right? But you want them to be careful. <laughs> okay, so that's all mental and emotional stuff, right? And that's important for you to keep in your mind. And if you want to get past where you're at and you're feeling not confident when you walk in the field, focus on that for a little bit. Just a little bit and see if that actually helps push you beyond. If that doesn't push you beyond it, the next most important thing, potentially the most important thing, is physic is the physical side of it. This is where this is what I need to do this year. This is my goal this year is to deal with my physical challenges. So how many of you guys work out three times a month? Work out Okay, how many of you guys run or do something cardio? Okay, all right. Uh, how many of you guys do any like weight training? Anything along those lines? That's fantastic. There's actually, that, believe it or not, that's actually more than we expect to be. Our society's bad at that. I'm, bad. I'm terrible at that. Um, I would probably feel a lot better about my game if I was about 30 pounds left. That's just the truth. So that's kind of my goal. You know? um, nothing improves your game like a combination of physical exercise, weight training, good weight training, good exercise, good cardio, regular cardio, and the repetition of good basic technique. Okay? So, and that is point control, so lunges and parries and footwork, all of that. If you can combine those into a workout, that's great. Fencing is a not a good workout. Fencing, generally speaking, is not good cardio exercise because we fight, blah, 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 and then we're done. Or we stand a lot and do nothing and wait and then there's a three second exchange and then we're done. Now if you fight all night, if you fight two and a half hours, you can pick up fights all night, you probably get a pretty decent amount of cardio exercise. But it's not going to be good and it's not going to be focused in terms of improving your game and actually making it stronger, et cetera, et cetera. You will get better win. Initially, if you haven't done it for a while, you lose some weight. But eventually it'll all, it'll all just taper up because it's not intense enough to actually get things done. Okay? So, one way to push your envelope is to do physical exercise, a regular regimens of physical exercise, weight training, push-ups, sit-ups, cardio, all of that, and also working on very simple basics, setting up a pell in your house, not a, don't hang a tennis ball from the street, 
set up a nice solid surface that you want to hit. All right, and just nice and slow. Stand and do a lunge. Have one down low. If you like to throw foot shots, put one there. Put a, put a pel there. If you want to go head, body, foot, head, body, foot, arm, whatever you want to build and construct, do it, and then work it. And work it for about 30 minutes. Okay, and just these simple shots. One, two, three. If you want to get really creative, you can build an armature. You can put a sword-like object there, like a, a wooden dowel, and you can work on closing the line and striking, closing the line and striking. You can do all those things. If you're not practicing, you're 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 going to take one ahead of it. No matter how good you are, no matter how good you are, you're going to be the physical side of this is really really important. Right? It's a physical game. It's athletic. Get athletic. Okay? Great. In the fight. <laughs> Yeah, come on up. Grab a sword and lead. Alright, so we've, we've learned that we're going to be energetic. We're going to be, we're going to have energy for that attitude. So we come on guard, right? We're going to have that thing. I'll put our boots on the eyes. That's good. She looks confident. That's fantastic. We fight, we fight, we fight. We have an exchange. And then we have a little lunch. And here's the And then go out. You ever see the attitude of my body change? How many times have you watched somebody fight? The exchange ends. The energy in the fight shuts down. As soon as we break measure, or just before we break measure, or in measure, your opponent's your opponent's energy fails. Okay? Everybody play video games? Right? Here? Yeah? Uh, with the apology for the hideous the mundane reference. Um, so you got like a little life bar, right, in the fight game. Then you got that little flashing cool energy bar underneath that makes you do the cool move, right? You can hit that, access that. You want that flashing all the time. You want that bar flashing all the time. If we're fencing, I need to keep it up every single time for the whole fight. That energy has to be there 100% all the time. Okay? The attitude of I'm coming to kill you needs to be there all the time, constantly. In your brain, in your body. All right? Don't ever let yourself go or, or any sort of loss of energy. Keep that energy running and rotating through your body constantly. Don't let it go anywhere. All right? Once you grab it, hold on. Okay? All right. Aggression is a state of mind. It is not a state of body. Aggression is not a direction. Okay? Um, go ahead and have a pop up for me. We all like to be, we all talk about being aggressive, I mean, almost, almost, almost exclusively, talk about aggression as this direction coming at my point. That is not the only direction to be aggressive. You can be aggressive going backwards. Okay? My opponent, I want you to throw very slow. So he throws two shots aggressively, right? One and two. All right. Now in both of those cases, I'm just parrying. Do it again. One time. Here and here. So one, two. There's a different attitude in my body. It's an attitude that's ready to spring and attack. The parries are aggressive. My defense is aggressive. Okay. He's coming into my space, but we're still fighting. One, two. He comes around again. One. And now I'm here. Okay? All of that is aggression, right? And you can be aggressive going backwards. You don't have to only be aggressive here. You should be able to close the line and carry aggressively and strong the whole time. Okay? Not only will that help you psychologically in the terms of dominating the fight, but it's going to help you in terms of getting to a place where you can strike back and kill them in that fight. So in your head, don't think that aggression only happens when they go out there. It happens when they come in here too. Okay? Ah, breathing. How many of you were taught how to breathe when you were taught how to breathe? Yes! One person. I'm so happy because almost no one ever says I was taught to breathe. Breathing is energy. If you don't have air, if you don't have air flowing, if you don't have breath going, you're screwed. You're screwed. Okay, so everybody set up straight. We're going to learn how to breathe. Probably done this before. All right, so I want you to imagine that there's a bowl located between your sternum and your waist, okay? Between here and here. That's a bowl. I want you to inhale through your nose and I want you to fill the bowl with air, okay? And inhale. Your belly should expand. Don't be, don't be proud. <laughs> now, exhale. Exhale through your mouth, okay? Again, inhale, fill the bowl. Hold it. Now, exhale. This time, I want to hear you breathe in, I want to hear you breathe out. All right, ready? Inhale into the bowl. Exhale. 
That breath pattern is a good way to oxygenate your body. That is a great way to get energy. It's a great way to get energy. Yes. One thing people need to be aware of is the chest one. Sure. Uh, as a lot of people yeah. break low. Right. As an actor, I always go. But one, two, it's a very good thing. Keep your ribcage out of the way the whole time. Then you can breathe freely. And your shoulders don't hurt. The ideal portion is to breathe. Most of us, when we fight, we do this. Fighting, we're fencing. <gasps> then we hold our breath until the thing's over because it's nerve wracking. Okay. I inhale as I parry, I exhale as I tap. Okay. Okay. You hear people shouting, you know, every now and again, like especially in modern fencing, Olympic fencing, they do a PI, just anybody who does that Eastern martial arts and I'm talking about <gasps> that kind of thing. That's the use of breath to, to increase power and energy. Okay. We can do that here. You guys are getting sun, feel free to rotate. Um, you guys are Any questions about the breathing thing? At this point in my life, I do so many breathing exercises as a theater student, as, a, as an actor and whatnot, that it's kind of second nature to me, so I don't always teach course. Yes? What about an extended series of multiple effects? You can't keep breathing out forever. Sure, correct. No, you can't breathe out forever. So find a time to breathe in that seems natural, in that sequence of events. Um, and if it doesn't seem natural, still don't forget to breathe. <laughs> That's the key. So ideally, you know, I'm in a series of tacks. <sighs> Find a time to 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 find that breath and use it and exhale. Just don't forget. To yeah. Oh, great lesson from great experience. My first heavy combat bout or fight outside of my heavy authorization was the like field melee. <laughs> and so we're all standing in line, and I got my sword and my board. And uh, one of the guys is like, "All right, everybody, breathe in, hold it, breathe out." And he says five times. Just do it five times before anything. Oh my God. Help the I do that every time before I walk on stage. You take five deep breaths, boom, go. Oxygenate your blood, livens up everything in your head. It's, it's a really good idea to breathe. Okay. All right. A system. Fighting from a system. This is the next thing. So you've got the physical thing down, but it's still not working. I'm faster, I'm stronger, but people are still beating me. you got the psychological thing down. I'm not, I'm not afraid anymore. I'm coming onto the field, and I'm not intimidated anymore, but I'm still not... Taking those guys out I want to take, those gals out that I want to take out. I'm not, I'm not the semifinals of Queens, I'm not in the finals yet, that's my goal. Whatever your goal may be, uh, I'm not doing Cup of Pharaoh as well as I would like to. Whatever your goal may be, this is the next step. Fight from a system. Okay? There are two different ways that we tend to teach in this, in terms of breakers. You get a cobbled together series of tricks, or you get a fighting system that you work from. Inevitably, the people who fight from a system start slower and go higher than the people who start from a bag of tricks. It's easy to learn a few different moves, practice those specific moves, and then apply them and win 60 to 70% of your fights at your local, at your local place. Okay? Maybe you're really good at a charge. Maybe you're really good at a one shot to the foot. Maybe you're really good at a one shot to the face. Whatever it is, maybe you do a good beat attack. Whatever that move or that, that maneuver is, you practice that one thing really, really well, you get good at it. That's what Fighting from a system is the application of a set of guidelines to any situation, which is why it winds up being superior. Because it is irrelevant when you come against. If you know your system well and you can apply it well, then you will do well against just about any other opponent. Uh, Bruce Lee talks about being without a system, which is in itself being a system, which is itself a system. Okay? He talks about being like water, you know, flow around the opponent. That's still systematic, okay? It's still a set of guidelines to apply to fight. So if you're not fighting from a system, if you're fighting from a series of a series of tricks, somebody who does have a system and knows how to apply it and practice it is going to dominate you. Even if you're faster than them, even if you're younger than them, even if you're stronger than them. That will win the day for them. Alright? Uh, I try to fight from as period a system as I can find. Um, I call it sort of a generalized Italian system because it draws from Capoeira, draws from Fabers, and draws from Chicago. But the truth is I try to fight in as systematic a fashion as I can because it works for me. It allows me to fight as many different opponents as I possibly can. And it gives me a textbook by which to go and find answers for things that I'm confused about. This person does this thing and I have no answer for it. How would Capoeira respond? How would Chicago respond? You know, if the person who taught me has a system, you know, how would how Jack, that's another one, that how would Don Jack McKee, who taught me how to fence, how would he respond? Would he do? These systems are important, all right? So when you, when you start fencing, 
if you are not currently learning from a system, or you are not currently fighting from a system, you might want to try to turn what you do into a system, or you might want to go seek one out. Okay? Because that may very well give you the tools necessary to move on. Um, one of my friends, uh, Gage, and Gage will tell you uh, that if you want to make sure that I get bumped out of the tournament early, give me a new book um, that I can study. Because what I'll do is I'll I'll take that book and I'll be as orthodox as I can about it, whether it's a period manual or whatever. I'll be as orthodox as I humanly can be about that so I can learn that system and add it to my, my own. Okay? But I'll lose for about three months. People will just be smoking because I don't really understand the time and the tempo of it, so I, you know, it takes a while to adjust. All right? However, now I have a whole new card to play. Okay? Now all of these, all of these moves, all of these tricks that you may have learned over the course of your fencing career so far, those are still cards you can play. All right? Those are still things you can do. Don't don't throw them away. Keep them in your deck. They're always going to be there. Okay? But if you start learning a system of fencing, you'll find where to integrate those cards. You'll find why they work or where they work from, and you can work from there. Okay? Hmm? Yeah, lot, that's a really good analogy, a lot like Legos. You can use them, use this block here, put it here, put it here, but you want to build a cohesive whole. This is how I fence. This is the principle behind my fight. This is how I fence, okay? So I'm going to share with you guys mine. Okay, I'm going to share with you some of the key fundamentals of my system of fence. I call it mine. It really doesn't belong to me. It belongs to a lot of old dead fencing masters from the past that I've studied. But it is how I fight. And the, these, a couple of these principles should be able to help you get past some things technique-wise. Okay? So go ahead and find, wow, we got a lot of people. Go ahead and find a partner. We're going to do, some, we're going to do a couple of things. Just grab somebody nearby. You don't, don't take too Grab a sword and a map. The system of defense that I use relates to timing, distance, and tempo. John, not the shape. Distance, or measure, is the relationship of space between two opponents, here to me. This can be shown as a line between our feet. Everybody see that line? Okay. Every line can also be seen as the diameter of a circle. Everybody would agree? That circle, we either stand over it with a bisexual stance, we have our front foot on the circumference of the circle, or we have our back foot on the circumference of the circle. However, circle up here, right, our mind. And that circle changes, gets smaller and bigger as our relationship of space changes. Did everybody, everybody see that? Everybody agree with that? Okay. Fastest distance between two points is a straight line. Go ahead and draw a straight line. All right? That's the fastest distance between two points. Here's the funny thing. His line wasn't straight, was it? His line wasn't straight because of where his shot originated from. Come on, guard. Did everybody see where his sword is now? As his sword moves through space, it is not tracing a straight line. The point is tracing a fairly straight line, I agree with you. But the entirety of a shot is not necessarily rolling on a straight line. Okay? Come on, guard. So this time, extend your arm first. Now it's happening. Now he's on the straight line. Everybody agree? Go back to where you were. Before, there was a moment where your weapon was not following the straight line. Go ahead and extend. Okay? It was not following the straight line. All right, go back to where you were. Extend now. No, nope, go back. Extend the arm first. And lunge. Good. All right. That's the first part of this that I want you to understand. Fastest distance between two points is a straight line. To get to the straight line, you can't have everything go at once. The hand has to go before the foot goes. Okay? Everybody clear on that? All right, so come on, girl. So fastest distance between two points is a straight line, which means I can make my opponent slower or faster by manipulating the line that my opponent is able to effectively draw. Does everybody understand that? Let me show you. So right now we're both on the straight line. If John just comes straight forward, he's going to die. Now I'm probably going to die too. In reality, my sword point doesn't, start, doesn't stop on a man's chest. It goes through him and he goes through me. We're both dead. Avoiding the death thing is important. Okay? John's faster than me. That makes him faster. So I have to make John slower. I'm going to make him slower by making longer, I'm going to do that by closing it. Okay? Now that his line is closed, John's straight line no longer threatens me, and mine threatens him. Okay? If he attacks on a closed line, all I have to do is extend my arm and do a small motion, he's dead. He's doing that. All right? John's not a bad fencer, he knows that. All right? So if I close my line, he has to go underneath it and change lines 
which becomes a curved line or a spiral, which is a longer line, which makes John slower. Does that make sense? I also, and by that same logic, I also made John shorter. Okay? Because I made him, I forced him to trace a longer line. It's almost as if I took my hand. I'm stealing from him. Okay, come on. So, my line is closed. If John does nothing, I have the straight line. Okay? And I have an advantage. I can now attack safely if he does nothing. Okay? And the next portion of this, now that I've manipulated his line, is what I can do in response. I have forced him to make a choice, right? So he goes and disengages, and on the time of his movement, I can strike him. Okay? That's the hard part. That's the part that takes practice and takes work and learning how to pull your trigger. Pull that trigger. Come on, guard. So here I close his line, he disengages, and on the tempo of that, I can strike him. Okay? Now you'll note, I still protected myself. I didn't just shoot, okay? If I close mine, and John disengages, and I do this, I'm still going to die. Yeah, I'm going to run through his face, but I'm still dead, okay? I didn't protect myself. I didn't close the line. In theory, I don't like it, but he disengages. Go ahead. I can do that. In theory, I don't like it. It's not as safe as the sword, but I'm still closing it, okay? So the first part is recognizing your distance. The second part is trying to put yourself as close to the straight line as you can, and to try to keep them off the street. Okay. These are principles that you can decide to fight. I can do this when we come on guard, we salute. He comes on guard, I say, okay, I see where John's line is. My system says I need to close that line. Okay? Before I can do anything, close that line. So I'm going to come guard, come on guard into a place that closes it immediately. I'm operating inside my set of rules. I'm good. I'm okay. I have an answer for whatever he does. If he disengages, that's my answer. If he shoots in a straight line, that's my answer. He has very few other options other than to break measure. Okay? He can leave, he can escape, and then we have to do that equation all the time. This system works no matter how you carry yourself, although I highly recommend you don't do this when you blade refused. Your sword's a really good tool. Okay? It's got distance, it's got time. Keep it out there and use it to manipulate your opponent's measure. Use it to manipulate your opponent's measure. So let's all get with a partner. And we're going to try this, this, these two answers. Okay? Grab your partner. Line up. <laughs> All right, so we should be right now out of measure, which is to say that you are at a range where you cannot strike or be struck by a lunge from your opponent. All right? Now, don't be so far that it takes three, four steps to get in. Come on guard with your opponent. Um, all right, interesting. Everybody's kind of in a weird spot. Uh, pick one yourselves quickly. Who's number one and who's number two? Don't debate. All right, great. Everybody got a number? Awesome. Number one, you are going to step into measure and close that line. Your hand is going to move into position just before your foot moves into position. Come on, guard. Go. Good. Do not move your body as one unit. Move your hand and then your foot. Good. All right. That's more of a lunge. Take a step, just a step. And relax. Twos. Come on, guard. Twos. You're going to step into position. Your hand is going to move and close the line. Okay. All right. Everybody take a look at me. Everybody take a look at me. Some of you guys are doing this. That is a lunge. That's not a, just not a step. All right? So I'm here, here, boom, take a step in. Okay? Just one simple advancing pace. Okay? Come on, guard. Two. Extend the hand and close the line. Step in. Good. All right. Everybody's got that basic motion down. Everybody relax. Um, are you again? Pay attention here. Come on, guard. So, I'm going to close. Oh, he's a lefty. Switch your right. <laughs> you can do it with a lefty, it's fine. I just don't want to go through it right now. I'll show you in a bit. So, my hand goes. I step behind it. Okay, that's kind of an extended version of that to show you each piece. The hand pulls me behind it. That's a little bit more smooth. That's what I want. I want you guys to look at my blade. And if you can't see it from where you're standing, come here and look at the blade. 
I already noticed which edge is near his weapon. It's the edge of my knuckles, my true edge, right? I've got my strong against his weak. Everybody see that, right? And my point is a little above, past his blade. A lot of people do the epic close. This is actually not a close line. This is not a close line. If he extends, he has my forte, he has my strong, and I'm dead. Okay? This closes the line. This gives precedence to the point. He has to climb his forte way up high to get my weak to then strike. Okay? That's way too much time for him. Alright? This is a line close. This is not a close line. This is not a close line. Now, I'm strong to weak, so it's closed from here to here, but it takes almost nothing for him to extend through the weak part of my blade. Does everybody see that? Okay? So this time, when you close the line, make sure that you do it with your true edge and your point just a little bit over their blade. Don't go reach too far, just a little bit over their blade. Okay? Back on guard? Then we'll get to the next piece. Number one. Number one, you're going to close the line and step behind the sword. Good. No strike. No strike. There you go. Again. Number one, close the line, step behind the sword. Good. Number two, back up to the measure. Number two, close the line, step behind the door. Good. All right, now we're going to add the next piece. In this piece, we're going to have to go slow. All right, we're going to go slow. I don't want to show it to you. Uh, who am I going to Kill it. Come on up. Next piece of the drill is going to be when the opponent does the stupid thing and fires along the closed line, you kill it. So, come on, Bert. Here. Uh, you tell me. Uh, so I close the line, my opponent will then attack, and I will extend my hand and strike him in the face. Okay? Go slow. Your opponent's forward motion and your forward motion will compound to increase the force. Okay? So I, I, I close the line, he extends, and I strike him in the face. Does everybody see where his blade goes? He might pass through the range of your guard. That's okay. All right? Strike straight in the face, close the line here. Okay? I close, I extend, boom. Everybody got that? Try nice and slow. Don't go fast. Don't get ahead of yourself. Move like you're moving through jello. Alright, ones. Step in and close the line. Twos. Extend the thrust along the closed line. Ones, close and strike at the same time. Nice and slow. Alright. Again, ones. Close. Slow down a little bit for us. See each moment. See moment. One, sorry, close line. Two, extend the thrust and strike and counter. Good, very nice, very nice, very nice. All right, now go do this at your own pace. Switch attackers and defenders, and I'll walk around the house. Go wait. Here, uh, close the line, she's going to strike. 
This is, the, this is striking counter time. This one's tough. All right. What's that? <laughs> I did. All right. So, the next step is striking in the time that they're disengaged. All right? So this time, I close this line. He disengages under. I don't want to wait until it gets all the way over here. Okay? I want to catch it as it passes there, okay? So do that very, very slowly. Find that time to move. So I'm gonna, we're gonna move like jello. It starts passing beneath, and I grab it with my hilt. Does everybody see? Everybody see how I got precedence to the point? And then I can strike, okay? okay? Does that make sense to everybody? All right, so try that nice and slow with each other, okay? Everybody gather back up. Everybody gather back up. Congratulations, you just learned like 75% of what I do. <laughs> Those two concepts can expand and expand and expand and expand. The idea of closing the line, forcing your opponent to make a bad choice, and then exploiting that bad choice. That's sort of the philosophy behind it. It's really the philosophy behind it. Forcing my opponent to do what I want them to do controls my opponent just as surely as if I've closed the line, just as surely as if I'm on the blade. By making them make a bad choice, I'm in control. Everybody got that? Good. Yeah, it, it, and it's just using geometry and applying geometry defensively. Okay, forcing lines to be wrong, breaking up shape. All right, the next thing I want to talk about is, first of all, I want to take questions from you. What is something that is in your way right now that you want to review? Let's see if we can analyze. Anybody got something specific right into the step forward and say, this is what I do, and I feel like it sucks? Yes. <laughs> the mental trigger of going from, I recognize I have leverage and engagement, and then throwing the shot. Excellent. So, pulling the trigger, it's a great analogy, right? I have the line. I got it, I know I've got it, but I just can't convince myself to execute. Uh, so Logos in the mid round uh, has a great drill for this. He takes a button, he sews it to a towel, and he throws it in the dryer. And he stands near his dryer, and every time the button clicks, he tries to throw a lunge. Every time he hears it in the side of the dryer, he tries to throw a lunge. Yes, five things. Uh, what that does is that trains you to execute on tempo, to execute with stimulus. Does that make sense? Click. 30 minutes, you got a nice Click. Oh my god. <laughs> I've actually tried it. That drill is hell. It's hell. Because uh, you miss, you miss 70% of the, of the damn clicks because you're either in recovery or not. But what you're trying to do is attack without anticipation. Okay? Is waiting for the click and as soon as the click goes, you go. 
Okay? That's, that's one way to break that pattern. Another way to break that pattern is when you go to practice one day, say, today, my only goal is to, when I close the line, throw the attack immediately. That's my only goal. I don't care if I lose every fight tonight. Today, my goal is to fix this one thing. And if you don't fix it by the end of the day, that's your goal next week, too. Okay? Claire, anybody else have something that they're struggling with? Yes? Mine is getting that block. Okay, so narrow, sure. So narrowing the space between parry and repose, right? So a lot of us think that we have to be faster in our movement, like our velocity has to be better. No, there's a lot of time wasted in the moment between defense and attack, okay? So the way that you deal with that is you find a drill partner, okay? And you just have them extend, and you just go, one, two. You think of it like music, okay? One, two, one, two, one, two. And you just keep drilling that until it is set in your brain. Do it to the inside, do it to the outside. One, two. Um, if you're trying to act in single time, like you want everything to go at the same time, you're going to have to pay attention to distance to know where you can do that from safely. Where a lot of times if you single time, you wind up getting just past our opponent, you never get them. Okay? You have to find the right distance. Once you have it in your head, you can physically tape it out on the ground, ideally for yourself, and then have somebody stand there and work. They'll extend a hand, and you'll just go slow. They'll extend a hand, and everything will come together, and eventually you work up to the so the short answer is practice and narrow the focus of your practice on that specific issue. Okay. Anything else? Yes. Uh, moving your arm without moving your feet is my body. I've been trained to tend. Yes. Many of us get trained that everything goes at once, right? Bam, that's the launch. Training hand and foot, the hand should move first and pull the foot on. Um, I teach that through metaphor. <laughs> I imagine that there's a string attached to a pulley attached to my foot, and the foot doesn't lift until the hand is extended. Does that make sense? So that's in my head. How can you train it? You have a good teacher who will watch your foot and watch your hand, and they'll make an angry noise at you every time you do it. <laughs> okay? Or they'll drill. They'll just extend and extend and extend. Okay? Anybody else? Puck will see this video, he'll yell at me for it to, to buzz at people when they do something wrong. Don't do that. That's bad. It's bad pedagogy, Puck. All right. Uh, no, if you have a good instructor, they'll be able to correct and say, your, your hand is moving first. Let's, let's go ahead and try to get your hand moving. Anybody else? No? Awesome. Everybody else has all the systems they need, right? We know where you are on the line. Yeah, you can totally look me up. Um, you still know enough to know the question. We both have a question. If I can give you any other tool, it's go home and practice footwork. Go home and practice closing your lines. Never stop practicing those two things. It's really, it's, that's 50% of fencing is having those good fundamentals. And then, yeah, the other stuff is said. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah.